Good afternoon. My name is Ashley Hawes, and I am the Director for Consumer Information at Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging. Thank you for joining us today for the 16th Annual CATS po Policy Lecture sponsored by Howard Weschwell Company. Today's webinar will be recorded. During the webinar, you may submit a question at any time using the Q&A or chat feature on the bottom of your screen. We have staff monitoring the chat to convey your questions to our presenters and to answer any technical questions that you may have. If you would like to tweet with us during today's lecture, please use our Twitter handle at BenRose1908 and our event hashtag, hashtag Cats Lecture. I want to thank HWN Co, our program sponsor, for making today's lecture possible. Now I'd like to turn it over to our president and CEO, Orion Bell, who will introduce today's lecture and our first speaker. Orion? Great, thank you so much, Ashley. Uh, my name is Orion Bell, and I am the president and CEO of the Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging. And I want to thank all of you for joining us for the Benjamin Rose Institute's 16th Annual CATS Policy Lecture on Diversity and Aging, which is sponsored by HW and Co. The CATS Policy Lecture was established in 2007 in honor of the late Dr. Sidney Katz, Benjamin Rose Distinguished Scholar in Aging. The lecture convenes advocates to explore potential policy approaches to important issues on aging. Dr. Katz was a physician, a scientist, a teacher, a mentor, an author, and a public servant who pioneered the concept of active aging, championed the development of the field of geriatrics care, and was the primary author of the concept of activities of daily living. The Katz family has remained strong advocates and supporters of our work throughout the years, and today we also want to remember Dr. Katz's wife, Beverly, who someone shared with us was a joy made um, possible through the contributions of Dr. Katz. This year's lecture will examine diversity and aging. Um, so it's now my great honor to introduce this year's CATS policy lecturer, Dr. Ms. Lauren Pongan. Lauren serves as the National Director of the Diverse Elders Coalition, a coalition of six national aging organizations that advocate for policies and programs that improve aging in our communities as race, racially and ethnically diverse people. These include the American Indians and Alaska Natives, LBGTQ plus population. As the National Director of the Diverse Elders Coalition, Lauren manages the DEC's advocacy programs and national strategy. Before coming to the DEC, she worked to support and build a national network of health equity leaders from Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities throughout the country. Previously, Lauren managed Pennsylvania's only Asian American domestic violence program, along with direct service health programs for Asian immigrants, refugees, and elders as part of CMAC. She was also managed a multilingual coalition of Asian American Affordable Care Act navigators from community-based organizations around the Philadelphia area. Lauren holds a Master's of Arts degree in Southeast Asian Studies from the University of Washington and a Bachelor of Arts degree in English from Colby College. So please join me in welcoming Lauren Pongan. Thank you. I'll just wait a second till my slides can come up. Thank you. So thanks everyone for tuning in today and thank you Orion and the Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging. I'm really honored to be here. Um, I wanted to just start off today when I was thinking about the title for a talk about how Diverse Elders Coalition engages in policy and advocacy. I thought about the way, the, what sets us apart. And I think for me that that's the desire to center our communities in everything that we do. And there are a lot of different ways that we do that that I hope to talk to you about today. So um, as Orion mentioned, my name is Lauren Pongan. I use she and her pronouns. And I guess I want to start off by saying that I don't feel like a policy expert or a public policy expert, but in the same way that I tell the diverse older adults that we work with who are advocates, I don't, I know that I don't have to be a DC based public policy expert to be a really effective advocate. And my lived experience and talking with um, our communities is really what informs, informs our policy and advocacy approach. Um, also, I'm very blessed to have really talented team members, such as DDA Trin, who is our newest director of policy and advocacy. So I wanted to give a big thank you to him up front, who was a thought partner in creating this presentation. Next slide, please. 
So I thought it was really important in just thinking about how we approach policy and advocacy to think about how we each come to, to do aging advocacy work. And I wanted to share a little bit about my personal journey. Um, because I think that my background, just like all advocates working in the aging space or working on any advocacy front, really impacts the way that I approach this work. So, um, you know, before, just I think lifelong, I've always really loved being around older adults, hearing from them. I think they have so much wisdom to share. I've always kind of sought them out at family events or in community. And I think you can see in this first photo, which feels really long time ago, um, that was at the International Drop-In Center in Seattle, Washington, which is a um, Filipino elder center for just a community gathering space, a place where older, older adult Filipinos can get together um, and have community and company. And I think throughout graduate school, their company and acceptance is really what got me through. I would spend many hours there learning from community. Um, Afterwards, as Orion already mentioned, I went back to Philadelphia and I ran an Affordable Care Act Navigator program, which was a coalition of about six organizations across Philadelphia, all of whom offered interpretive language services to help connect anyone who was using the Pennsylvania-based marketplace to get healthcare or to get Medicaid enrollment. And we did this in eight different languages. It was sort of the first moment where I understood how important language access was in order to connect um, to connect people with health coverage and health insurance and to address the uninsured rate in the US. Um, the second picture is from my next iteration of work, which was working at a community-based organization called CMAC in Philadelphia, where I worked on as a, a domestic violence program for Asian American immigrants and refugees, and then also an elders program. So this photo is actually from the elders program, which was my a great joy of my life for about um, 100 different elders from four different groups. As you can see in the photo, I'm holding a microphone or hopefully you'll be able to see, I'm holding a microphone and my colleague Hang is next to me. So I worked with 100 different elders in four di with, from four different ethnic backgrounds and I almost couldn't speak to any of them. We were always using interpretation, um, but I got to hear from them and be a part of their lives and they really inspired just, you know, they, they really inspired and motivated me in my work. Um, and that being in that community space was really integral to my understanding of how older adults, especially limiting, limited English proficient older adults have to navigate health and social services or get access to programs. And then finally, the third picture is from my national, my national level work, um, working with Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander health equity leaders across the country. So some of you might um, recognize that uh, sculpture in the background from the hill in DC, um, but that you know those opportunities to be with leaders and and bring people who don't also consider themselves maybe policy experts, but are community leaders with deep understanding of their communities and cultures and the policy solutions that are needed. Um, we were able to help those types of leaders bring their stories, bring their advocacy efforts to Washington DC. Next slide, please. So working in diversity and aging is not just about community or data, but it's also really personal, right? Um, I am not an older adult myself, but I hope to one day age into the demographic that I'm currently serving. But I also have grandparents and older, and my parents now are also in the 65 plus category. So I just included this picture. This is both sets of my grandparents. Um, and I think it's really resonant for everyone who has older adults in their lives to think about the, the obstacles and opportunities that our older adults face. So for example, um, my white working class grandparents faced sort of the typical things that we think about, such as you know, difficulty in affording a nursing home at the end of their lives, financial strain, access to services, et cetera. But my Filipino grandparents, which is, the left picture, which you probably deduced, um, they, you know, they lived in the U.S. for probably 40 years, 50 years, and gave their best working years to the U.S. and um, contributed to the economy, to the community. And then when it came to their end of life care or their, their care as they became older, 
they had to move back to the Philippines because there wasn't a system and a structure for support for them here in the US. They couldn't receive culturally competent care. They couldn't receive, receive affordable care or quality care to the same level they could um, in the Philippines. So they moved back and sort of they lost the last 10 years of their lives to be with their children and their grandchildren. And so instead of seeing them every weekend because of having to move because of the lack of care infrastructure, um, you know, we saw them once every six years or something like that. And now I see that as my parents age and my aunts and uncles are aging, they're also moving back to the Philippines because of the lack of infrastructure here. So these issues of caregiving, of aging, diversity are really important to me, um, which kind of led me to Diverse Elders Coalition. Next slide, please. So for me, the draw of working at, in a space such as Diverse Elders Coalition was the appeal of being in a space that was intentionally intersectional. Um, as you could probably glean from the pictures I went through, I worked at uh, Asian serving organizations for, I worked at a string of maybe four different aging, er, sorry, Asian serving organizations. And in this current moment, I felt like it was really important to think as a coalition or think intersectionally um, how we could work together. So um, for just in case anyone doesn't know, Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality and it's about how our different um, how our different identities intersect. And so as a biracial person, you know, this overlap of identity, these this intersectionality has always been really front of mind for me. Um, and then I was able to come to Diverse Elders Coalition and see that they're an organization that's both centering not just intersectionality, but allyship, because not everything that affects one of our members affects all of our member organizations, but it's that allyship which is sort of the missing or like the magic sauce of the coalition, right? Just because it doesn't necessarily impact one organization, it doesn't mean that all the organizations won't stand together in that. Um, in the decades to come, the communities that we represent as Diverse Elders Coalition or DEC will collectively form the majority of older adults in the US. And our vision as a coalition is a world where all older adults can live full and active lives as they age. So the coalition was founded in 2010, and we advocate for policies and programs that improve aging in our communities as racially and ethnically diverse people, American Indians and Alaska Natives, and LGBTQ plus people. So that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer and questioning. And just before I move forward, a quick note that we separate out American Indian and Alaska Native from saying racially and ethnically diverse people because a lot of folks, um, while some people may think of that as an ethnicity or race, others recognize that um, that's also the status of being a member of a sovereign nation. So there's that sort of duality and we just wanna make space for how people self-identify. Um, as I mentioned, we're working to strengthen policies and programs that enhance the health and well-being of diverse older adults and also educating and connecting these diverse older adults and their caregivers to key policy debates on aging to increase public support for issues that impact our communities. Next slide, please. So we would be nowhere without our member organizations. And I just wanna give them a shout out now. So that's the National Asian Pacific Center on Aging or NAPCA, the National Caucus and Center on Black Aging, NCBA, the National Hispanic Council on Aging, the National Indian Council on Aging, SAGE, Advocacy and Services for LGBT Elders, and Southeast Asia Resource Action Center. All of our members are influential players in the federal policy arena, and they're experts in the distinct needs of the racial, ethnic, political, and cultural communities that they represent. And when I think of our members who are just fantastic, I could talk to you for the next 30 minutes just about our members, but I won't. Um, but they're really bridge builders. They have done the really difficult job of gaining the trust of their community on the ground, as well as earn the trust of federal policymakers and agency leaders to be experts on what these communities need. So they really just fill that divide. Um, and they provide not only expertise to say, you know, federal policymakers and agency leaders, but they also provide really needed services and resources for community members themselves and for their caregivers. Um, we believe that our members are uniquely positioned to effectively reach communities and not just in cities or on reservations, but in rural areas and throughout the US. Um, 
And then internal to the Diverse Elders Coalition, this little mini organization within the coalition, um, I just like to share that we are very, very tiny and that we are only four people, large organization. Um, and we're really pleased to have just brought on our first DC based director of policy and advocacy. So we're taking all of the work we, that we've been doing in policy and advocacy, but with a new DC based person, we're very excited for the next um, couple of years of advocacy. Next slide, please. So today I'm not just gonna share with you policies that we focused on, but because the focus of this lecture is on diversity and aging, I think it's also really important to, to share with you some of the lenses, values, and frameworks that we use to approach um, advancing our policy and advocacy agenda. Um, and I wanna start with just giving a little brief overview of what aging in the US looks like for diverse older adults. Next slide, please. So according to the ACL, the Administration of Community Living, at the US Department of Health and Human Services. In 2019, there were 54.1 million Americans aged 65 and over. And of that, um, 6.5 million were aged 85 and older. And then as you can see from this infographic, in 2034, which is just over a decade from now, the older adult population is projected to outnumber the number of children. Um, which I found to be a really startling statistic because of how often we hear about policies and programs that support children, but we very, very rarely hear on the national stage about policies that support older adults, even though this is about to be a huge portion of our demographics. Next slide, please. And America's population is not only aging rapidly, it's also becoming more diverse. So by 2030, the number of people age 65 and older who identify as LGBTQ plus is estimated to double. And then Census Bureau forecasts indicate that by 2050, roughly 42% of all people who are older adults age 65 and older will identify as a person of color. Um, including the, L the aging LGBTQ plus population by 2050, the communities that we represent as Diverse Elders Coalition will collectively represent more than half of all older Americans. Um, I share these stats because I think it's interesting to see how our populations are evolving and will are projected to evolve, but that's not an indication that we should wait till 2030 or 2050 till we're a more significant percent of the population um, to make policies and programs that are responsive to the needs of older adults. So, you know, I think th there's an argument that while we see this as a projection, these issues are really relevant now and we should be designing solutions now. Um, also, I think outside of looking at the aging of these demographics, I think it's important to recognize some of the critical um, social determinants of health or health disparities or general disparities that exist. So outside of aging, I think it's important to know that communities of color in general face higher poverty levels in the broader population. Um, in fact, African Americans, American Indians, and Alaska Natives experience poverty at double the rate of the broader population and Hispanic Americans at almost double the rate of the general populations as well. Moreover, at the same time that this is happening, that there's an increased poverty rate, um, populations also reported, underrepresented populations also reported a prevalence of disability, which could include difficulty in hearing, vision, cognition, ambulation, self-care, independent living compared to the general population. So we have high poverty levels, high prevalence of disability, and then these same communities are self-reporting um, less access to medical, um, to medical insurance coverage or medical care. So it's sort of this recipe um, that's leading to health disparities that we sort of know, but there are a lot of contributing factors um, that are related to historical oppression, et cetera, lack of services in communities, um, lack of economic justice that are contributing to these overwhelming health disparities. Next slide, please. Um, I think, you know, <laughs> the last few years, we've also really been in this sort of like cultural awakening moment, right, around diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm using air quotes because I don't love that term, um, but it's sort of a shorthand for what we all know um, is centering diverse voices, trying to create inclusive spaces, and then you know, trying to further equity. Um, I think that 
I just wanted to take a minute to remind us that we're sort of in this moment of, of being focused on that. Um, I think the pandemic really exposed and elevated and also exacerbated the existing inequalities that we were witnessing. And then of course, George Floyd's murder, among other things, really amplified the national will to take action on these issues. And a lot of people have been trying to respond, trying to incorporate DEI practices into their organizations, into their advocacy, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, I know that for me coming to Diverse Elders Coalition sort of at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, we received a lot of, in, you know, a lot of new invitations to collaborate, a lot of organizations, funders, et cetera, expressed a, a new interest in centering diversity. Um, and, and while we've been able to take, um, to collaborate with a lot of new partners and move that work forward, I think we also just question, like this headline is asking, you know, is this a, is this a long-term commitment that organizations, funders, government are making, or is this just kind of a temporary, um, a temporary take up of something that's become at the center of national conversation? Um, I think a good, another important kind of context point to share is that among diverse led organizations, you know, we're often left fighting over the scraps of, of resources and kind of uh, communities can get pitted against each other for not that much money overall, whereas kind of mainstream. So, so an example of this would be if there's money allocated for language access, you may have different communities fighting for resources to do interpretation or translation for their communities whereas a much larger pot of money is just going toward English, um, resources in English. So I think that there's real opportunity and real opportunity for impact for when organizations can collaborate with one another to present a united front in these advocacy asks and efforts. Um, I think I, I also just wanted to bring up DEI because I, diversity, equity, inclusion is not a type of check the box type of commitment, right? So it's not something you can say like, I did DEI, we hired one person, we hired multiple people. Um, it's a long-term commitment to learning and to being wrong and owning mistakes and to learning from and hearing from community. Um, and that includes Diverse Elders Coalition. You know, we are constantly trying to refresh our language, make sure the ways that we help or the ways that we talk about our communities are accurate, that we're um, learning from other organizations, putting on racial justice trainings, et cetera, so that we are, um, so that we are most uh, most inclusive, as inclusive as we can be in this process. Next slide, please. Um, so this, you know, this is just another brief slide overview of DEI. I think we can go to the the next slide. So I stole this slide from our caregiving training curriculum, but it's because I think it's really important and just when I, because I'm going to be saying the word equity a lot, and I want to make sure that we have a shared understanding of what equity means. So um, I think equality is often thought of as fairness, like everyone gets the same resources, right? Everyone has equal opportunity. Um, but in the literal sense, everyone, so in the picture, everyone's getting the same box, but no, not everyone can see over this fence, right? So there's kind of this inherent assumption that we can achieve just outcomes if everyone gets the same opportunity, but it really fails to take into account histories of oppression within the US and the cumulative toll felt by communities that are diverse in race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, immigration status, and more. So the move toward equity pushes us to abandon this one size fits all notion and instead create specific targeted strategies for communities that have been historically excluded from services and, and resources that they need. So in the picture, equity looks like recognizing who doesn't need a box to see over the fence and who may need multiple boxes, um, which is their resource to watch the game. Um, and we hope that once we move towards equity, which is a continual process that we won't just have, so equity is a process, not an outcome, I would say, um, and that we can strive toward liberation, which is why do we need a fence at all? Um, next slide, please. So I thought the idea of fences would dovetail with this idea of boundaries and barriers of federal policy. Um, I think the work that the Diverse Elders Coalition really has, we have our work cut out for us, right? Because in this national conversation around policy, federal policy, we are left at the margins, both from the perspective of diversity and aging. Both of those groups are really afterthoughts in federal policies. Um, 
Next slide, please. So apologies that the slides are getting a little text heavy, but we some of the challenges that we see in our efforts to, to engage in federal advocacy, right, is we need champions on the Hill. Um, aging is not a very sexy topic. And, you know, we see, we see um, issues that, like very similar issues getting a lot more coverage um, when they're for different populations. So a good example of this is in the recent Build Back Better legislation, right? We heard that there was a focus on caregiving um, and an ask for caregiving infrastructure within that, but the conversation at the national level, in the press, in the media, et cetera, was really about caregiving with regard to children um, and not so much disability and or aging, which that is not a not knock to any of my colleagues in this work. You know, childcare is really important, it's pivotal, but so is, um, so is caregiving for older adults or folks with disabilities. Um, I think this also just points to an opportunity for some narrative change work, including storytelling to change hearts and minds and to develop those national um, champions for issues of aging on the Hill. Um, and I know, I mean, I think that's really accomplishable and we can invest in, in elevating elder voices to kind of identify those aging champions, et cetera. Um, another reason is lack of disaggregated, of good data. And when I say good data, I mean both disaggregated data and there's some missing data. So we could do an entire long <laughs> um, presentation around disaggregated data, but you know, a really um, good example of this from my community is that when you look at Asian Americans, it looks like we're doing well in the US in some ways, but when you break it down by different um, ethnic groups or sub-ethnic groups, there are really wide variations in what folks need to succeed or you know, poverty levels, education levels, et cetera. Um, when I say missing data, you know, if we think about SOGI data, so sexual orientation and gender identity, those weren't even asked on the most recent census. Um, so we did not learn about how many folks identified as LGBTQ or trans or what people's gender identities were. Um, and kind of a mantra that my colleagues at Sage and I were talking about, and I think many other communities use, but with regard to the census, if we are not counted, we don't count. Um, there's also a lot of challenges in hearing from older adults themselves in designing policy solutions, right? So I listed a few of these out here and I'm just gonna share a couple notes on them, but language barriers, a lot of our communities, limited English proficient. Um, I think there is a lack of civics training or understanding how the government works, especially as things have evolved, right? Like now you can do, you can meet with congressional staffers on Zoom sometimes or call or email them and not everyone knows how to access um, their legislators, even though their legislators are elected to work for them. Um, there's also chilling effects of anti-immigrant, anti-people of color, transphobic and homophobic policies. Um, it's pretty resource intensive to reach out to older adults if you have to you know, go in person. Um, a lot of folks are spread out rurally. There's a technological divide. A lot of older adults have mistrust in and of the government. Um, but in spite of all these obstacles, you know, this is really important work that still needs to happen. And it's something we're constantly assessing, how do we improve on our outreach strategy to older adults? Um, likewise, the pandemic um, led to, you know, increased isolation, health issues, broadband access, or lack thereof, or other, other additional challenges. Um, also, just thinking about our status as a 501c3 nonprofit, I think there's a lot that we can do, and we don't have to um, necessarily rely strictly on lobbying, but when we look at these opportunities, noting that we are excluded sort of both from the aging perspective and the diversity perspective as a lens towards advocacy, I think we really think about how do we both infuse existing, um, infuse legislation as it's being created um, with aging and diversity considerations and how, we, how might we develop and propose new policies that specifically address and are targeted toward helping and serving diverse older adults. Next slide, please. So our approach to policy and advocacy, you know, the midterms are coming up, which I think we all know. 
and or you, you may be starting to get lots of political ads, but we really believe at DEC that aging and diversity should be nonpartisan issues. Regardless of who's in office, everyone should care because we will all hopefully age into the demographic of older adults um, if we're not there already. Um, so that's why we take a different approach, which is long-term relationship building and embrace, try, you know, try to build those connections regardless of um, what party people are in, because we know that you know, there's a lot of opportunities for across the aisle collaboration when it comes to older adults, since these issues impact literally everyone in all communities. Um, also, I think looking ahead to midterms, we are keeping in mind that we can examine regulatory advocacy opportunities if there's not a lot of legislation moving because of having a divided government, which is a possibility. Um, we also think about intersectionality and coalition building that includes constituents, which are, you know, older adults themselves. And then we take the opportunity to partner with organizations who are allies, such as Justice and Aging, or other organizations who have overlap with us, but may represent different constitu constituents, like National Alliance for Caregiving, who look at caregiving across the lifespan. Um, we also collaborate with paid leave advocates, disability justice advocates, et cetera. Um, next slide. Okay, again, apologies for the text heaviness of the slides, but um, I wanna talk about some of the values that undergird our advocacy and policy efforts. So the first one is equity versus equality. Going back to the baseball game slide, we don't ask for one size fits all solutions, but we want communities to have what they need to thrive, whether that's one box or multiple boxes. Um, we also embrace social justice, anti-racist lens, inclusiveness, um, and just acknowledge the impact of systemic oppression and racism, homophobia and transphobia. We also talk a lot about this nuanced vision of social influencers of health versus social determinants of health. So we think, you know, social determinants of health, of health really sounds like something that can't be helped, whereas we know actually it's an influencer of health. Um, and that's why we really try to embrace, you know, person-centered care, human-centered design as an approach to designing solutions, and then hearing from member organizations and older adults based on their lived experience. We always, when thinking about what might be best for our communities, you know, we, we talk to community and then we also think like what is this a policy solution that makes sense and how can we um, continue to advocate for that? Um, next is just that stories matter. So it's not, we, we've talked about how quantitative data is missing, but qu qualitative data is also really, really critically important. So we wanna get, um, you know, we want to hear from older adults and get their stories in front of policymakers. Um, because I think the, they're the ones who have, have this lived experience and can help change hearts and minds. Um, also, I think another framework that we have is just thinking, when we think about um, storytelling and advocacy, we don't just want to demonstrate that our communities are suffering or that they are disempowered, we also want to uplift the community driven solutions that work, right? Um, so we try to find a balance between portraying the need as we know it and observe it, and then also the ways that our communities are strength based or resilient or have protective factors and cultural practices that really um, help them to thrive and how can we use formal supports and services to uplift the practices that are they're already putting in place. Um, and finally, self-determination of our member organizations. I think, you know, working in coalition, if any of you are, you know that you might not all always have the same agenda, right? So for us in designing our advocacy agenda, we recognize that for American Indian and Alaska Native older adults, they may have different pressing needs than Asian American older adults. But we think about how different member orgs can be leaders in different spaces and on different policy fronts and how they can um, bring in other, bring us up to speed on what we should be doing. Um, next slide, please. So I'm gonna dive into our, some of our federal policy focus areas. And the first um, is caregiving. Next slide. 
So I just wanted to first give a shout out to the Johnny Hartford Foundation and to Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging and Dr. David Bass's team for their support in our work and our caregiving research. So several, bringing back, bring this back to the um, lack of, uh, of good data on our communities. Several years ago, I think in 2017 or 18, we conducted a literature review and realized there wasn't enough or deep enough data on diverse family caregivers for older adults. Um, so in response to that, and with funding from the Johnny Hartford Foundation, Diverse Elders Coalition before my time, so I can't take any credit for it, but they did um, 18 stakeholder interviews, 36 focus groups um, with 93 affiliates in 25 states. And they did this in eight languages, serving up 1100, about 1,100 older adults. Um, and this led to the creation of our caregiving curriculum, which is called Caring for Those Who Care, Meeting the Needs of Diverse Family Caregivers. Um, we've taken what we learned through that research and created this curriculum so that we can help health and social services providers know how to better support diverse family caregivers. And also so we can help policymakers understand what policy solutions are needed. Um, to date, we've trained around 3,400 health and social services providers and delivered around 60 trainings. Next slide. But also during the pandemic, we realized that things have really shifted for caregivers for older adults. So um, in order to help support older adult or caregivers for older adults, we conducted 11 webinars that offered community resources and services, and we collected polling data from them. And with the National Alliance for Caregiving, we compiled this into a report called Family Caregiving in Diverse Communities. Next slide. So some of the data that we learned about with regard to caregiving was you know, just these needs that we were able to lift up to Congress um, through a congressional briefing and, uh, and a report, which is that a lot of family caregivers during the pandemic were experiencing really high levels of anxiety, isolation, um, and financial strain. Those were the kind of two highest um, categories. So folks were concerned about taking care of themselves, preparing for the future financially, and they really wanted emotional support and financial help. Um, along with that balance of saying, you know, our communities are not only suffering, there were also really strong protective factors we saw, such as 55% um, of caregivers mentioned that they appreciated spending more time with families, learned new technology, and had decreased commute times. Next slide. So I would be remiss and hypocritical if I didn't, you know, spend a little bit of time letting um, some of our community members speak. So I'm going to share this short video with you. And I've seen this clip probably 20 times, but it still makes me laugh and cry. Um, but this is Sharon in Hampton Conway. And right before this clip starts, um, Sharon was, was sharing about her journey of being a caregiver to her husband right after he had his arm amputated from a motorcycle accident. So hopefully we can play this. I was a kept woman for um, 30, what, 30, what's 30, what's 20, what's 52 minus 16, 40, 36? Anyways, I was a kept woman. I didn't put gas in my car. I didn't open the door. Um, uh, and, and all these things that he did for me, he was not able to do anymore for me. And uh, and I know it bothered him to see me pumping my own gas. I know it bothered him seeing um, me taking out trash and garbage. And and uh, and he felt bad. And uh, I I didn't. I was born for this. I've been a caregiver for 35 years to many family members, to my grandchildren, and to my son, and our son. And so. Um, and I told the Lord, I said, if you give me this man, I don't care how many pieces you take off of him, if I could have his head in a handbasket, I was going to be happy. And so I could, I could go on like this for the rest of his life or mine. The only limiting factor is I'm getting older. And um, I feel a lot more on me physically now and my health than I did 16 years ago. 16 years ago, I was only 58 years old. I was still kicking high and squatting low. Yeah, yeah low. baby, I was. Yes, sure I was. Were. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, so now I get that leg up and I can't get it down. <laughs> so I, 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 so I, I realized that. And unfortunately, Camp is going to need care for the rest of his life. Eventually, I'm going to need care. I was able to get long-term care insurance. Um, he was not. He could have gotten it, but because of his uh, pre-existing conditions, it was so um, expensive. We lost our house. And so we decided, because because since he's a veteran, we knew 
push comes to shove, he could he could go to a a, a VA a VA um home. But um for me, I knew I needed um some uh, out because I did not want our children to be taxed with us. And that brings on another point that you'll see in many ethnic communities is that um, they exude the promise. And the promise is, please don't put me in a nursing home when I get old. You know, I wanna stay home as long as possible. Now I know that people who are not um, all the ethnicities that Keisha was listing and everybody else was listening, listening um, they also don't want, didn't wanna to go to a nursing home. But historically, um, the nicer places um, that we are now seeing um, 50 years ago were meant just for whites who could afford them. And um, so we had no choice but to go to a nursing home that was the dilapidated crap, the crap that looked like bedlam. And, and, um, and so that's what we didn't want to, uh, our parents and grandparents didn't want to be sent to anything like that. Now, these nicer places has, have opened up. And we found a lot of resistance, even though my, our mother had um, uh, long-term care insurance and so did my dad, they were very resistant to going to an assisted living because they thought it was a nursing home. So I think there needs to be more education about um, what assisted living is and what it is not. Also, it would be great to be able to have more access to these facilities um, either uh, as a tax credit, if you go to one to help you pay for, because some of them are very expensive, and um, or a long-term uh, insurance that make those premiums more affordable, so that um, you and I can I'm actually able to to make that deduction on my income tax, but still we're paying over a hundred thousand dollars a year for our mother to have um, care in my sister's home because my sister has injured herself. Uh, lifting my dad um, because he lived with them too. So she has torn rotator cuffs in both shoulders. She's no longer able to lift my mother, but she's only able to afford care for her mother for um, six to eight hours a day. So that means for 16 hours, you have an, an older, when she's my, my sister's going to be 70 in January. She has to do all of this with two busted shoulders. And it's difficult for her. And so in the meantime, the care to my mother is compromised because my sister's not able to turn her over. My sister's husband has a bad back and he can't do it. And so um, th these problems are not unique to us and they are uh, even, um, even worse in some cir circumstances. What about the families who aren't, um, they didn't have good jobs. We have a very good um, retirement, but we had a huge, huge savings that was completely depleted care for my grandmother um my, my, my aunt and uh and and so it, it it doesn't make sense that we would have to sign away our home to be able to stay in our home and um and generational wealth in our family we don't even do that anymore so that's gone so but this has to be some some um some help somewhere but i Thank you. So I I mean, I just think that this couple is brilliant because they put in really real terms, the stakes of caregiving, the obstacles, um, they share their lived experience as caregivers and care recipients. And um, though these are the types of voices and stories and folks who know what they need. Um, these are the stories and voices we want to raise up, right, for Congress, for other policymakers, for federal agencies, etc. Next slide, please. I was a kept woman for um, 30 Thanks. So this brings me to a key piece of legislation relevant to caregiving. And I know we have, I'm probably gonna go over time for a minute, but um, the recognized assist includes support and engage, AKA the RAISE Family Caregivers Act and its newly released national strategy on family caregiving. So the RAISE Act was a response to the recognition that family caregivers aren't adequately supported by the government or the public and private sectors and support is fragmented, siloed or inaccessible. Um, so just, I think last week, they released a national strategy to support family caregivers and it's a whole of society approach to assist family caregivers. Um, the strategy includes more than 300 actions that agencies may take and includes corresponding actions for states, employers and community-based organizations. 
um, the RAISE Act Family Caregiving Advisory Council and the RAISE Advi and the Advisory Council to support grandparents raising grandchildren work together with technical assistance from the ACL to um, create also create an additional um, report cross cutting which is called cross cutting considerations for family caregivers and they actually used our congressional briefing at which the Hamptons you just saw where where they spoke um, to inform this idea of of cross-cutting considerations. And one of those is, you know, the diversity and equity angle. Um, I think that the RAISE Act has really great potential in these 300 identified actions, but we're really going to need to see stewardship and champions to provide oversight to make sure that agencies implement these possible changes. And our whole approach to this work is that these you know, we love to see the development of this strategy, but how are we going to continue to infuse all of these actions with like DEI related best practices? How are we going to understand the ways that diverse communities need to be specifically served within these implementations to make the policies effective for everyone? Next slide, please. So um, I'm going to go through these pretty rapidly, but other key focus areas are the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act in 2025. So 2025 sounds a long time away, but it's coming up really quickly. And our work is beginning, we'll basically begin probably as soon as the next elections finalize and in January when new members of Congress are in place to think about how we can build equitable appropriations to address articulated community needs, right? So Again, we don't want to see communities pitted against each other for small amounts of money. We want to see a united front that asks for equitable allocations um, that center community needs, especially for services targeting older Americans through the OAA. Um, and also just maybe taking a step back to see, does the OAA still meet the needs of older adults or do we need additional legislation down, way down the line? Um, not soon, but down the line, is this a comprehensive, is this bill doing enough, right? Um, to address the needs of diverse older adults or are there some new things we need to tease out through legislation? Um, also, when we look ahead to some other opportunities of that might not be tied to specific legislation, but policy asks. So continued advocate, advocating for home and community-based services. We wanna see in, continue increases in funding and appropriations so that our community members can age in place. And I think lots of people wanna age in place, right? But it's really critically important. Like when I think about my grandparents who want, who want to receive culturally appropriate services, right? And our, the members of the Diverse Elders Coalition want to age in place in their community. And that could mean with family, with members of their tribe, where they can receive culturally appropriate services, food and language. Um, we like to see investments in, in home and community-based services versus institutions that might not prioritize things like language access, appropriate culturally appropriate food, et cetera. Um, Lift the Bar Act, we've um, been looking to leaders like Justice and Aging and NILK to think about, you know, how can we restore healthcare access for immigrants who've been here for fewer than five years, you know, recognizing how important this is for um, lawfully present immigrants, which includes lawful permanent residents, DACA recipients, and other folks living in the US, um, and just kind of removing arbitrary barriers to healthcare access. We're also looking ahead to things when we surveyed our member organizations, economic justice is really top of mind. And un unfortunately, exacerbated by the pandemic, that's not just progressive economic policy, but it's things like making sure our communities have access to basic needs, things like housing, nutrition, and food programs, healthcare access and jobs um, was like top of mind as critically important and what constituents are most concerned about. Um, in addition, mental health is uh, is needed for mental health supports and services are needed for older adults and their caregivers. We knew this before the pandemic, but the pandemic really exacerbated these needs and how these issues of access, they, they can overlap with issues of physical health access. But we're talking, when we say mental health, I'm talking about everything from Alzheimer's and dementia to things like PTSD and just emotional support and counseling services. Um, and then finally, in, pan in any pandemic intervention or rollout, we want to see we want to see equitable equitable approaches and approaches that will reach communities who are difficult to reach or who might not speak English or who may not be hearing news about um, about pandemic best practices from conventional locations. Um, 
Next slide. I realize I'm over time. Um, so next slide, please. So I'm going to just close with this. So it's just some of the guiding principles that we bring when I said that we can infuse current um, policy opportunities with just some of our values um, versus making new legislation. But some of the things that we're always going to ask for across the board include protection. So that can be um, for, for folks from different sexual orientations and gender identity, discrimination protections based on race or language, et cetera. Lang um, the second is language access. We're always going to advocate that services be services, communication, et cetera, be made available to folks in the languages that they speak. Um, we also know that data is critically important. So we're gonna be advocating for stronger data collection for our constituent communi communities, because unless we can demonstrate need, it's really hard to ask for resources if you can't illustrate the need, right? Um, and then finally, culturally adaptive services. So that includes services, formal services that are culturally appropriate, accessible, adapted for different cultures and communities and person-centered care. And that all of these are provided, um, that there's meaningful access to these things. Um, next slide, please. So I know I went over time, but I just wanted to give a big thank you, Salama, to the Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging, to DDA, Ocean and Nina, my colleagues at Diverse Elders Coalition and our six member organizations. And then a special thank you to um, Dr. David Bass and Sarah Powers and Rachel Cannon at the Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging for their continued partnership and support in our projects. Great. Well, Lauren, uh, thank you so much uh, for your for your presentation today. I, I don't think you went over time. I think you're actually we're, we're, we're right in the, we're right in line here and it's all very interesting. Um, some great, a lot of food for thought uh, uh, in that today. Um, so thank you for your presentation. And then also, um, are there any questions uh, from the uh, participants uh, today for, for Lauren? I'm gonna ask if there's any questions in the uh, Q&A or in the chat. Yes, so we did have several questions that came through. Um, first, I just wanted to say that participants really enjoyed the testimony that you provided in that video. They really got a lot from of it, from it, and they really felt like that they could relate to the Conways. Um, so thank you for sharing that video. video. It was very impactful. Um, going back to your slide on aging, um, and diversifying the nation where you shared um, those statistics. We had a participant that was wondering if the predictions on the percentages of diversity in the US population, if all of those predictions came from the census. Thank you. I think that um, they came from the census and then from ACL. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Sure. And then we were wondering, um, what are some things that everyday people, um, so people that aren't really involved, um, you know, in Washington, that just everyday allies um, can do to advocate for older adults in our communities? Sure. Um... I think, you know, advocacy starts with um, with learning from our diverse older adults. And I think, you know, if I, I think like a lot of older adults feel invisible, um, don't feel seen in a community, don't feel recognized. And I think, you know, building those personal relationships and interconnected relationships so that you're learning firsthand from people um, about what their lived experiences like. I think that's kind of the first step. Um, I think in general, older adult services, you know, there are so many obstacles to accessing them. I mean, even if you think about um, someone trying to access any formal services who have computer access and are technologically literate, there are still obstacles. Um, and I think that's why we advocate for community-driven solutions and care. So I, I guess in long, I'm not giving a very succinct answer, but I think 
it's hard to give a blanket answer of what to advocate for for older adults, but I think um, getting to know the communities around you, if it's local legislation, that's great. I think for anything, the, the one thing that comes to mind is advocating for increased appropriations and support for different services that fund, um, I mean, sorry, different services available to older adults. So that's anything coming through the Administration for Community Living, a lot of Medicare services, Medicaid access for folks who are dual eligible, um, just making sure the programs that we already have are well funded and continue to be um, in addition to the development of additional services. Thank you. Those are some really great ideas. We had a participant that was wondering if the results from the community caregiving survey with the John A. Hartford Foundation, if they were available for the public. Yes, um, they are. There is a, so we have a lot of resources available at diverseelders.org slash caregiving. Um, I don't know if I'm able to type that. Oh, I think I can type it to everyone. I'll put that in here. Um, there's a toolkit with a lot of the facts um, the things that we've learned, a lot of fact sheets. And then we also do offer trainings to organizations of different sizes, um, like tailored trainings for the populations you work with. And you can submit a training request at diverseelders.org slash caregiving as well to learn about some of those best, practice, best practices specific to the communities that you work with. Thank you. A participant said that they concurred that we must shift the narrative regarding caregiving for the elderly and, dis and those with disabilities. They were wondering, how do we promote the voices of aging champions? You, you kind of spoke um, a little bit on this earlier, but if you could kind of move it towards more so being a champion. Sure. Um, there are so many ways to do this. and kind of what I was getting at with sharing some of my thoughts around DEI in general is that this is a journey. It's not like a place you arrive at and then you're like rubber stamped for life. You are great with DEI, you know, you're there. I think we are constantly evolving in our approach to this work as well. Um, and I think it comes from at, at every opportunity that we have to speak up, to highlight people, like looking at who we're giving the stage to, right? So as we try to develop, say, champions in, let's say, on the Hill, right, we need to have more stories to show impact um, and, and data, data and stories. So, you know, the Conways, for example, they, they spoke at a congressional briefing and staff, congressional staffers were really moved by their story because you can tell right away um, just what you get like a little glimpse of what life is like for them as caregivers and care recipients who are older adults who are also caring for their own parents. Um, so I think anytime, you know, anytime you're putting together a panel of speakers, who's on that panel? Like, do you have, do you have diverse voices in the room? Um, are we giving our elders an opportunity to speak? I think, um, Another another great thing that I think I think I saw that she was on this call. Um, Becky from the National Indian Council on Aging reminds me. It's like when you give an older adult an opportunity to speak, you know, you want them to let them tell their full story too, um, and not just say, "Oh, you have four minutes. Go ahead." You know, like we want to honor their lived experience and the things that they've learned throughout their lives, and then recognize that they know a lot about what they need, um, and lift up the things that they're asking for as well. Thank you. Uh, another attendee said that they appreciate the comment that you made about intersexual, intersectional coalitions that try to break down political party barriers. They wanted to know, do you have any tips on successful coalition building across political parties? Yes. So I think that a lot of times it's finding finding that common ground, right? Like there is common ground in surprising places. I think some of the, um, some of the collaborations I've seen over time through odd bedfellows are like people who recognize that a huge, you know, part of their population might be from a specific demographic group and that they have particular needs and be willing and interested in serving them. So I think, you know, I think a lot of um, 
a lot of legislators aren't champions of things because they don't even know they're a problem, right? And so I think step one is to help put help to put community needs onto people's radar. Um, I think kind of developing developing um, developing that rapport, like that's why we do take this long-term approach, right, to relationship building with policymakers um, to try to think about how can we over time gain trust and get people to understand the depth and breadth of issues. So I think, for example, you may get a member of Congress who when you, the first time that you talk to them, you wanna to talk to them about serving, say, you know, um, American Indian older adults who live in their state. They might not, it might not be top of mind for them, but by the third or fourth time you're talking to their office, they may be interested, they may realize that there are opportunities to help that community that are, um, you know, not politically controversial that have really good health outcomes. And that's part of having good data too. Um, and when you can show say impact or cost savings or um, the ways that health outcomes can be improved in a tangible way, that's the really compelling argument in partnership with sharing community stories and kind of getting to those humanizing factors, right? Like not one policymaker doesn't have a grandparent. Um, everyone has someone, everyone has a heart and that and heartstrings that can be um, activated and like a sense of what's the right thing to do. And I think kind of appealing to people's, like making, making a case for how universal a lot of these things are for older adults and the fact that we will all become hopefully older adults if we're not already. Um, and don't we want to have services in place for ourselves and the, the people we love? Thank you. Those are all really great reminders. Can you speak further to ways in which major national organizations in aging are organizing among themselves, especially concerning the 2025 OAA reauthorization? Yes. So I, um, I would say, and I might not be in the loop about some organizing going on, to be honest, but I think I think for most folks, like at least at um, Diverse Elders Coalition, we're sort of waiting to until post-elections to see who will be in office for the reauthorization efforts, right? So I think we'll be looking, since we focus on diverse populations, we'll definitely be looking to, you know, the Tri-Caucus and other um, leaders who may become champions of, of, of appropriations that we would need to provide services. But I think, you know, developing long, um, I think I think there will be an, a concerted effort post January 2023. Like, is that what year we're approaching? Um, in 2023, I think we'll be we'll have concerted efforts to get folks to the table and talk about like, what does this look like? How are we going to educate? Um, how are we going to educate members of Congress on what what we see needs, what we see we need um, moving toward the 2025 reauthorization. Thank you. Yeah, they said that their sense was that it had been relatively fragmented in the past. So thank you for sharing that clarification. Sure. Um, we do have time for maybe another question or two. Um, this participant wanted to know if you had any specific data about how diverse groups are affected by dementia, including Alzheimer's disease. Um, we do. Uh, we are, I, I don't have these talking points off the top of my head, unfortunately, but um, we are engaged with both the Public Health Center of Excellence and dementia caregiving. So we're doing a lot of that work from the dementia caregiving perspective because of our focus currently on caregiving. Um, and that is uh, a CDC funded Public Health Center of Excellence through the University of Minnesota, um, which I would encourage you to look at. They've been putting on really great webinars about the intersection of diversity um, in care and approach to services and um, and research even. So I would I would encourage you to look at that. And then also we've been working um, with the team at Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging to make resources that are culturally tailored for 
for diverse family caregivers of people with dementia um, and Alzheimer's um, to make programs that are tailored for them more accessible. So that's that's called best practice caregiving. And I'm, um, I, I'll let the Benjamin Rose team supply any additional information on that since it's a collaboration between our organizations. Thank you. And I believe that um, if the link wasn't posted, we can definitely post that link in there. Right. Uh, um, and then lastly, just really quickly, is there a group that addresses recent refugee se seniors from Afghanistan um, and Ukraine? Um, I think that the short answer is that there probably is that I'm not aware of. Um, we are definitely, uh, as I said, in a constant um, evolution to try to be more inclusive, looking at national underrepresented national demographics on for aging. Um, but I am I'm not sure if um, there are country specific national level aging organizations. I see that you're also looking um, in a specific, I see, I think I see this question as well in a specific demographic area. Um, I am not sure as of now. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Orion. Great. Thanks, Ashley. And thank you, Lauren. Um, now I have the great honor of introducing our reactor panel. Uh, so let me take this opportunity to introduce the panelists to you. First, I want to introduce Lindsay Goldman. Lindsay is our first panelist, and in, since January 20, 2021, Lindsay is the Chief Executive Officer of Grantmakers in Aging, a national membership organization of funders working to mobilize the intellectual and financial capital to improve the experience of aging. She draws on nearly 20 years of experience in program development and administration, direct service, philanthropy, and health and social policy. Lindsay holds a BA degree from Wesleyan University and an MSW from NYU. Welcome. Lindsay. Um, next, I want to introduce you to Willie Wright. Willie is the program manager for the National Caucus and Center on Black Aging, or the NCBA. Willie learned about this his organization when he returned to Cleveland, Ohio, after working in social service field for more than 20 years. And as a participant in the NCBA, Willie works as a job counselor a job developer and now is the program manager of the programs. In his 25-year career, Willie has worked with youth, families, and seniors through programs design and implementation for large and small nonprofit organizations. Willie, thank you so much for being here today. And our third panelist is Alan K. Neville. Our, uh, he's the Senior Vice President and Chief Equity Officer for the Metro Health System here in Cleveland. Alan has over 25 years of experience in successfully guiding large Fortune 500 organizations through large-scale cultural transformations. Alan is a graduate of Cleveland State University with a BA in Liberal Studies and the Case Western Reserve University's Weatherhead School of Management, having earned an MBA at the program there. Thank you, uh, Alan, and welcome to all of our panelists. The first question I would like to pose to all three of you is this. Um, are there some themes that Lauren presented today that you would like to respond to? Absolutely. <laughs> Here's <Yeah>. your chance. <laughs> uh, we had, we had uh, plenty of things to uh, marinate on uh, based on Lauren's outstanding presentation. You know, as, as I think about this, um, the, the situation that we're in, there is no, um, excuse me for the lack of using this term, but there is no silver bullet to this. Um, this is a multifaceted um, issue. And, and as I think about this personally, I think about my mom who's 88 years old, and I think about uh, access. I think about um, having trust in not just the healthcare system, but just in general. Uh, I think about what's transpired really over the last two years in terms of mental health and the social isolation that has impacted all of us, but in particular, our senior community in a huge way. Um, there are so many challenges as our, as our population gets older. We have to make sure that we have the services that are available to them in an equitable fashion because we can't take a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, so as we move through the dialogue, I've got several things that I'd love to share around some things that we're doing within our system, 
that um, we really help, we really hope um, can serve as an example um, that other communities might want to model after. Great, thank you. And for me, um, one of the areas that, that Lauren brought up was the, of course, the Conways and, and, and the story. And that's what resonated with me was the, was the Conway's story. I hear that story from, from not only African-American Conway's, but from Asian Conway's and Hispanic Conway's and Caucasian Conway's having to navigate that, um, navigate the, the, the system without destroying the lifestyle. And that's one, of the, that's one of the areas that we have to address when, we, when those individuals come to seek employment from us or seek the avenue of being re-employed from us. So yeah, those stories are real, real. And getting that out there is, is just so important. And Lindsay, how about you? I think I'd also like to speak to the caregiving issue because I think there is a lot of momentum um, at the national level as well as the state level around caregiving. Um, so aging funders, as you all know very well, are few and far between. Um, philanthropy also suffers from its own uh, kind of ageism. Um, and in an effort to target limited resources, we sometimes become trapped in these false dichotomies that can limit our thinking, right? So healthy versus sick, caregiver versus care recipient, nursing home versus community dwelling, paid caregiver versus family caregiver. These are very fluid and not mutually exclusive categories. And sometimes it just depends on the day or even the hour how people identify. People are complex, they move between environments. And we often talk about the social influencers of health, which are you know, analogous to the social influencers of aging, but sometimes we don't think as much as we need to about the social piece and the fact that we're aging in relation to other people. And so as funders, we're well-intentioned, but sometimes the way that we fund actually reinforces rather than reduces age segregation and inequities. And this is particularly true for historically oppressed people who are more likely to live in multi-generational households, more likely to be providing care to children and older people simultaneously. Um, so, you know, you think about a respite program that provides personal care aids to support family caregivers of older people. And those personal care aides are mostly women of color. They're also aging. They do some of the hardest jobs for some of the lowest pay. The respite provider reports to the funder on decreased caregiver burnout and depression. And we count that as a success. But in reality, we've prioritized one population at the expense of another. And so, you know, later in, in this conversation, you know, I'd love to talk about what would it mean to have our funding be more aligned with how people actually live their lives and what matters to them? You know, how could we fund in a way that is mission congruent, but more equitable, that truly values all people and doesn't prioritize one population at the expense of another? Right. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Um, Lauren, I want to just uh, note that I was making as, as you were going through your presentation, you talked about the importance of the disaggregation of data. And I know very often older adults in populations are um, not called out in a, in a particular population segment. We have a, in Ohio, we have our Ohio Aging and Behavioral Health Alliance. And uh, here at the state level and at, at national level as well, one of the roles in advocacy in that space is to call out the needs of an older adult population around behavioral health and mental health issues, substance use, uh, serious mental illness, those, those kinds of issues, because very often the categories are presented as children and adults, um, and the needs of a aging senior population uh, can be quite different um, than those of perhaps a younger adult population in the community. Just a great illustration of, of that as, as you talked about the importance of calling out the data and using it to tell the story. Thanks for that. All right, so uh, now I have a question specifically for Lindsay. 
Uh, I'd like to turn to you and ask you what steps you're taking at Grantmakers and Aging to address many of the longstanding inequities in our community, and what are you planning to do next? Sure. Well, thank you so much, Orianne. It's really such an honor to be here um, with this panel, and thank you, Lauren, for your remarks, which were very inspiring. Um, so at Grantmakers and Aging, you know, we're a membership organization. We serve as a network and resource for funders. We're a champion for aging-related issues and investments. And so our goal is to help those who are already funding in aging to do their grant making more strategically, and then to help those who are not funding in aging to either see the light and begin to fund in aging, which is the ideal, um, but more likely is to optimize their investments by applying a life force perspective to funding areas like housing, transportation, economic development, racial and gender equity, really looking at intersectional funding. And we're very proud to have Benjamin Rose Institute as a GIA member. So many of our members, uh, we have about 120 of them right now, have funded critical data collection, policy analysis, and advocacy to elucidate and challenge injustice. We've funded programs and services to address the needs of those who have experienced inequities, but now we're also starting to look inward to acknowledge the inherent power imbalances between funders, nonprofits, and the communities that they serve, and to see how we might also further advance equity through our funding practices. Um, and that really starts by recognizing our power and acknowledging that philanthropy is rooted in unjust systems and structures where wealth is accumulated, often uh, for the few at the expense of the many. And, and that is the reality. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to help our members ask themselves some tough questions. You know, Lauren mentioned the feeling of fighting over the scraps that are kind of left over. Um, and that's, that is real. And so we're helping our members to think through who we fund, what we fund, and how we fund. So are we funding the same organizations year after year? Who's leading those organizations that are getting funded? Who makes the funding decisions and how are they made? How do we know that our funding is truly meeting the needs and preferences of the communities that we hope to serve? What outcomes are we measuring? and how are we measuring them, and who decides what outcomes are meaningful? And finally, is our funding bridging or further separating the generations? Um, and so, you know, for us, we're seeing some really powerful examples um, from within our membership of funders, you know, thinking very intentionally about how they're deploying resources. And so one example would be the CARE Fund. Um, and that's an acronym for Care for All with Respect and Equity Fund. Um, and it includes GIA members like the Ford Foundation and Robert Wood Johnson um, looking to invest $50 million over five years to build a movement for a universal publicly supported care infrastructure. And they're applying a holistic perspective to care and caregiving. So they're looking at both paid and unpaid care providers, care recipients, older people, younger people, how do we provide high quality care and good dignified jobs, recognizing that we're all interdependent and play multiple roles. And so the CARE Fund has invested in Diverse Elders Coalition, as well as Justice in Aging and Us Against Alzheimer's. And not only are they capitalizing these organizations, but they're also helping to put aging on the radar of new funders who have never considered aging by elevating those intersections of aging, disability, childcare, workforce development, racial and gender equity. And when we align our identity focused social movements, our advocacy and our philanthropy, we can have a greater impact because that's more people, more money and more power. And so similarly, GIA is aligning with other philanthropy serving organizations that we have not worked with in the past, like the Early Childhood Funders Network, the Asset Funders Network, and the Economic Opportunity Funders to help our members better understand those intersections. The other things that we're doing is elevating trust-based philanthropy practices. 
uh, as well as impact investing as two strategies that philanthropy can use to advance equity. So trust-based philanthropy focuses on redistributing power within the philanthropic and nonprofit sectors. It includes practices like multi-year unrestricted funding, higher overhead, streamlined and alternative reporting, um, rethinking how are we using evidence? Um, because in some cases, the evidence is inconclusive because interventions haven't been tested with diverse older people, or there are some interventions that are working with a population, but the evaluation is just too expensive. And so we don't wanna use evidence uh, as a way to perpetuate funding inequities or lack of evidence. Um, and one of the most exciting uh, innovations is participatory grant making, where you know, we often make the case that older people are assets to communities, but they are also assets to philanthropy. And there's value in their lived experience that can be harnessed through shared decision making. And finally, looking at impact investing, looking beyond traditional foundations, making traditional grants. So impact investing means investing capital to generate social impact and provide monetary returns. Um, impact investments often provide a, a larger amount of money in communities um, and really allow organizations to accelerate and scale their activities more quickly and more broadly as a result. Um, and we're starting to see uh, some of our members you know, look at how they can target impact investing through loans um, or through uh, investment in um, funding intermediaries like community development financial institutions to help bring needed capital to communities that are underserved by mainstream finance. Also looking at how they can, they can align their endowments um, with their missions. So those are just a couple of ways um, that we're working to uh, make both the, the philanthropic sector and our society more equitable uh, from the funder standpoint. Great, thank you so much, Lindsay. Uh, next, I have a question for Alan. Uh, Alan, from your time at Metro Health, uh, what are some of the challenges that health systems encounter and that Metro Health has or is planning to address uh, here in our community? So um, just a little bit of background about Metro Health. We are a public safety net institution. We're 185 years old. Uh, we started out as the city infirmary. Uh, then we became the city hospital of Cleveland. Then we took on a county focus. And now we actually uh, have the ability to provide services across nine counties uh, in Northeast Ohio. Uh, but just wanted to give you that, that, that backdrop. We were also founded 185 years ago under the premise of we will take care of you regardless of how sick you are and regardless of your ability to pay. So we tend to take care of the folks who slip through the cracks, who quite often come from underserved, underrepresented communities. So giving you that backdrop, when we think about what is, what is really impacting the vast majority of our patients, in some way, shape, or form, it's tied to the social determinants of health. And simply put, if I don't have affordable, adequate, safe housing, if I don't have a job or, or a means to, to make money in order to pay my bills, if I don't have healthy access to healthy foods, fruits and vegetables, I'm not going to be healthy. And what we found particularly over the last couple of years is not only is that lack of being healthy physically related, but also mentally related. So when we look across those social determinants of health, all of our efforts across our system, be it on the inpatient side or the outpatient side, are really geared around creating equity for all. And in order to have equity for all, we've got to engage everyone. We have to engage our patients, our employees, as well as the members of our community. About 95% of our employees are also our patients. And the last thing that we want to happen is an employee goes into one of our facilities, and if she, he, or they don't have their Metro Health badge on, they're treated one way versus if they have that badge on. Everyone should be treated with the same level of dignity and respect, regardless of whether I walk in with my title. I'm another human being just like anyone else, and I think someone put in the chat, at the end of the day, uh, to me, this is not a Black issue, a white issue, a brown issue. It's a human issue. 
And we all have to realize that when you strip away what you see on the screen right now, we're all made of the same stuff. It's as simple as that. Flesh, blood, bone, and a lot of water. Okay, so, so when we break this down to its most basic components, that's where you start to realize that you have to exercise what we refer to in our organization as empathetic listening, listening with both the brain, so the head and the heart, in order to develop these solutions. And it's not just one person's responsibility. This cuts across sector. It cuts across for-profit, non-profit, not just healthcare, but financial services. Every single industry in your local community actually has a responsibility, a moral obligation, I would say, around changing the dynamics. When we look at our seniors, there are a couple of things that come in mind. From a healthcare perspective, we realize that no two people are quite the same. So we have to do some segmentation of our, our elderly patients. We have some folks who, I'm 58 years old, we have some folks who are 80 that are probably in much better health than me, much healthier than me. So you've got those folks who um, we look at them and through the lens of, from an offering perspective, really around community health. And we have to do our provider to patient ratios a little differently for that group because they don't have a lot of stuff going on with them that requires them to go outside of just normal, you know, well visits. We then move into some people who need a little extra touch. And we've developed an offering called Spry Senior, which addresses that. That allows folks that are kind of in that 55 to 75 year age group to have access to all of their needs, both healthcare needs, but also some of the social needs, because I spoke a little bit earlier about the social isolation. So for instance, within our Spry Senior facilities, they have access to yoga classes, to a space to have coffee with new friends, to develop those relationships, all the while being in a social hub environment that also allows them to get their medical needs taken care of all in one location. So in between appointments, I can have I can have coffee with Willie and, and we can, you know, perhaps play chess or checkers or pinochle and, and develop a relationship. Because for the last couple of years, if you think about it, people have been locked up at home and afraid to go out. So we realize that human interaction actually leads to healing. So, so we've set that up. We also realize when we look across those social determinants of health affordable housing for seniors is a huge issue. Now, all of us, you know, we're, we're either hourly or salaried. We could say we're on a fixed income, but the impact that that has on our senior population is even that much more critical. So we're actually in the process of building two apartment complexes that are specifically for seniors. Affordable housing complexes that are very close to our main campus because we realize that our senior community deserves to have safe, affordable housing. And in fact, in one of those buildings, we're moving our campus uh, safety and police forces off campus into one of those facilities. So it's right there. So we, we think about the housing. We're also in the midst of, of looking at building single family dwellings as well within the general vicinity of our main campus. So those are a few things that we're doing. We also look at it through the lens of, and, and I mentioned we've got these segments of, of, our, of our patient population, moving from those who are pretty healthy to those who need a little extra touch, but then we've got folks who have really high medical needs, followed by a third group that has not only high medical needs, but high social determinants of health needs. So going back to when I mentioned not having access to healthy fruits and vegetables, that person lives in a food desert. Their needs are going to be different from someone who lives in a suburb where you've got a plethora of uh, supermarkets, if you will, to pick from. So, so understanding that segmentation and, and realizing that, again, you have to have a higher touch for that group versus another. And that requires our providers to really build trusting relationships with those patients so that they can get to the core of some of those issues. I might have high blood pressure and diabetes, 
and I'm living in a food desert because all I have access to are, are a lot of snack foods that aren't good for you that are full of sugar and or sodium. And instead of having access to, to healthy things to drink, I'm drinking pop. And I don't know if everybody here is from the Midwest, but we say pop in the Midwest. Some people may say Coke, some people may say cola or soda, but I think you get the gist. <laughs> High fructose corn sugar, corn syrup, loaded drinks. But, but really, you know, we, we have to think about that entire continuum from a health and wellness perspective and, and really marrying up the, the, the mental side as well as the physical side. And then the last thing I wanna to touch on is, and I think the Conways, you know, with their comment around potentially losing their home, that, that's, that's a very real thing. And, you know, I, I think about the fact that, and I'm kind of on that cusp, I'm 58. So, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, I'm probably in that last chapter of my work career and what's going to happen to me next. We, we have no option but to get this thing figured out and it takes all of us. And I think what, what we have to realize is that we need to do a lot more listening than talking because no one, there's no one person that has all the answers because if they had it, we would have figured this out a long time ago. So I think we all have to kind of humble ourselves and listen to one another and learn because it will take a village, if you will, to address this. Um, when, I, when I think about some other things that we're doing within Metro Health, it, it's imperative that we not only engage the patient, she, he, or they, that is a senior, but also the rest of their family as well. As we develop these solutions, be they medically related or addressing these social determinants of health, people wanna be included in their care plan. I don't want a group of providers standing over to the side talking about what's going on with me. Include me in that conversation because guess what? <laughs> I wanna have skin in the game as well. So those are just a few of the things that we're doing. Great, thank you so much. All right, Willie, I wanna to turn to you now and ask you what policymakers, what should policymakers be aware of in order to help keep older adults from historically oppressed age groups age and live well in their communities? I think you're muted. I have to get used to that. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank yeah, okay. you. Just talking. Can't hear me. Uh, one of the things that that really came across for me from Lauren's presentation was um, was the Conways, and I want to speak to that just a minute. Uh, and that that relates to just the stories because they are they are leveled and they are cross cross the racial divide. And, and in NCBA, and just let me go back and just give a little bit about what we do, the National Caucus and Center on Black Aging, we're, a, we're an employment program for seniors 55 and older that's looking to get back into the workforce. We're funded by the Department of Labor and the Older Americas Act. And um, we work with those individuals to um, sharpen those old skills because we are working with that group that was um, that had a work ethic, you know. You either went to school or you went to Ford, to or Jones and Lockman and got a job, and you raised families on that. And so now, for whatever reason, they're having to come back into the workforce. It may be because of lack of funds. It may be because they need to. They are caregivers of older and younger uh, individuals in their families, and they have to increase those incomes. And so, one of the things that we hear across the board, we hear that story from the Conways, you know, that those, those, um, those individuals that have homes in the Glenville area, the Collingwood area, the Mount Pleasant area, they've raised their families. And, but now not only do they need to have uh, uh, a, a, some sort of employment, some sort of income to keep those houses and to keep those homes active, but they also need to have um, um, access to funds to make sure that those houses are restored, to make sure that the windows are, are in place, to make sure that the, the infrastructure of those homes, that they can no longer afford 
Uh, they need help to make the, to make that happen. So so finding that type of cross um, support for them or what we call supportive services uh, is key. So 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 that story, uh, you know, I smiled at the Conways because the Conways was my mom and dad, you know, and 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 I remember um, now both parents are gone, but you know I remember them having to make those those hard decisions about the family house and, and what happened to it and what happened to them, you know, as they aged, um, what resources are out there for them to, to tap into. Um, you know, thankfully enough, you know, my, my parents um, trained us, their kids, um, to look out for those and in the areas that, to look out for those resources and in the, and in the areas that we worked in, which is all really pretty much the service industry, we were able to, to, uh, to access some of that information. But there are so many that come into our offices now that, that, are, that are clueless and we hear their stories. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. But more importantly, it's the trust level. Who do we trust? You know, um, you know they, they don't trust the government. Because, you know, they think that the, you know, the government is going to take what little income that they have uh, and um, or, or they're going to get in trouble. And so constantly sharing with them, sharing information with them on the level that they can get it. Um, it's easy for us to say. And, you know, it's one of the things I am constantly sharing with our staff is that, you um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of information out there. You know, the World Wide Web is just that. It's the World Wide Web. But it's it's the World Wide nothing for a senior that don't have access to this box. I mean, and, and, and for a lot of those individuals, um, that is the truth or that is their real. You know, they can't do this. They can't come on to a webinar and chat about um, um, chat about the the, the, the uh, access to benefits and, and opportunities because they don't even know how to get into it. So the first thing that we have to do is to, is to help educate and or re-educate. Uh, we may have some seniors that, <laughs> that had, you know, have some access to, 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 the, um, to computers and to access to, to, to um, you know, working inside the uh, World Wide Web back in the day but that day has changed. And then this system just changes literally daily. And so we're constantly finding those workforce partners, those, those, those um, organizations that can help us help them so that they can, they can benefit from, the, um, from the, uh, the, the services that are out there. But we also too, we also over and above this box, we have to be able to share with them the story on their level so that they can get it. Um, because if, if, we don't, if we don't share with them on the level that they can get it, all of this means nothing to them. It's like, it's like deer in the headlights, you know? And, um, and so I find myself sometimes literally taking, taking the hands of our, of our elders and literally walking them through the process. Um, and for them, that develops a trust relationship because, you know, just, just sharing with them, here's the information, go out there and get it, you know, you know, be, be successful, find that job. We literally have to take them through and walk them through the process. Um, there's a fear factor that is there. Uh, well, let me call it, it's a fear factor and a pride factor. The fear factor is, um, I don't know nothing about this. I don't. The pride is, I'm not going to let you know that, you know, because I'm, you know, I'm that guy who raised that family, um, who put that kid through school, who went to Ohio State, um, but yet I can't, I read on a, I read on a seventh grade level. I read on an eighth grade level. That's that pride factor. And so in working with that, with that now um, population, we have to first let them know 
There is no fear there. That comes with the trust. That comes with the relationship that you build with them. And then once you've done that, you know, do just what we've been, all of us has really been touching on. Not only, not only hear the stories, but really listen to the story. Because within the story, you're going to find the the possibility, you know, just sitting and 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 sometimes that story seems to be a little convoluted. It goes out here, but uh, but but still, you want to hear it. You want to hear what the because in the story, you're going to find out what the needs are. You're going to find out what the concerns are, and you're going to find out what the fears are. And so we try to do that um, uh, in NCBA as we are helping them to find that full of part-time employment that they're looking for. But more importantly, once we know that we've got that, it is, as Alan was mentioning, it is those, it is those other areas. It is the housing, that's real. It is the finances, it is the, um, uh, uh, the health. And so we try to do, uh, we try to offer those wraparound services um, to offer our, our participants those inf that, that uh, set of information as well. Uh, to help them be successful in employment. Um, for example, with, with uh, Benjamin Rose, your ESLP program is paramount. We love that program. And in fact, we were in our second year of that. That financial literacy program, the one thing I hear from our participants all the time is that, you know, that was some information I didn't know about. And, and now how they are using that information to use those limited dollars to be able to take care of their families and to take care of their homes. So, so that type of that type of relationship uh, is, you know, is, is paramount. And then and then, you know, finding um, the 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 necessary health care uh, or at least channeling them towards that is 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 paramount. Because when we age, you know, there, there are some issues, you know, spirits uh, the Bible says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, my flesh will be 65 years old next Tuesday. <laughs> some of the things I used to do. <laughs> I can't do anymore. And uh, I like to think I can, but let's be realistic. That's the same thing with the participants that we work with, you know, that um, they like to think that they can get out there because they, they did work at Ford Motor Company or they worked at Jones and Lockman, you know, but um, yeah, they, 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 they can't do that. So finding those, those, those age employment options for them is real. And then as part of that story, and then I'll end, as part of that story, sharing that information with our employers that are looking for employment, that are looking for employees. After the pandemic, we've had this wave of employers telling us what they're, this is what we need to open up. This is what we want. Yes, we're looking for seniors. Well, when you're looking for seniors to work for you, be realistic in that looking. And, and, and so at, at NCBA, we are constantly sharing that information with our, um, you know, with our employers. Yes, you've got, you've got um, um, age-focused employ employees that's really ready to get out there and work, but realistically work in the areas and in the lifestyle that they're in, you know, so, that, so we talk about what they can live. We talk about how long they can stand. Or, or, or how focused they can be. And so you'll find a lot of, in, a lot of our, our, our uh, participants, you know, they're not looking to go work out at Amazon. We've got a couple of folks out there, but everybody can't be out there. That's a, that's, that's a, that's a very labor intensive, mental intensive um, piece. So telling that story, sharing that story with our employers, and then finding what's realistic from our, from our uh, participants and then finding the services out there to work with that is part of the capitalized uh, uh, piece that we do at NCBA. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Alan. If I could just chime in really quickly. So, so uh, Mr. Wright, spot on, 100%. <laughs> and you know, one of the things that we talk about with, we can't just assume that as a senior, folks don't want to work anymore, but okay. we have to, find creative options for them. So for instance, within Metro Health, we are in constant need of nurses. There are retired nurses that if we can bring you back eight, 12 hours a week, 
to dispense all of this knowledge that you have on our more junior nurses, there's wisdom there. Absolutely. There's many, many years of being in the trenches that that's invaluable education. So that's one thing. The second thing around reskilling, and I love the fact that you brought up that we have opportunities to reskill folks. So we have a partnership with Tri-C, Cuyahoga Community College, where we actually have a, a job access center on our campus where people within the community can go to school, number one, for free. I'm gonna say that one more time, for free to learn some of these things. So we have people who come in who have never touched a keyboard and a mouse and, and couldn't tell you which one is which. All the way to folks who do have some level of, of computer literacy, perhaps they play Candy Crush on the regular or, or solitaire. And we meet them where they are and then begin to build those capabilities. So my last point is we have to understand that we have to meet people where they are, treat them with the dignity and respect that they deserve. And, and I honestly believe that you don't stop learning. My grandmother, before she died, she was 96 years old and she knew every new dance that was out there. Not just line dances, but every new dance. And she danced all the way up until she, she ended up passing away. So, so I think our brains have um, a level of elasticity where we can continue to learn and grow. So we shouldn't let a number that's associated with the person dictate whether they have the ability to continue to learn, grow, and develop. Great. Thank you so much. I think that uh, meeting people where they are is a great way to kind of pull all this back together and um, that these are these are not only questions for older adults, right? These are universal things and that um, Lindsay mentioned the idea that you don't have to have an either or, that these things that make life better for an older adult population, for seniors, for family caregivers, are things that are beneficial to everybody in society, not just not just the old. All right. Thank you so much for that. Thanks for all the, the panelists uh, for sharing your insights and your expertise on these on these important topics. Uh, we now have some opportunity for questions. Uh, going to invite Lauren to rejoin us. So if there are other questions in the chat or from the QA section, uh, here's another opportunity to talk to the experts here. And Ashley, I will turn this over to you. Thank you, Orion. I just wanted to remind everyone to go ahead and submit their questions in the chat or in the Q&A if they haven't already. We have had several come through. So I just wanted to start with all of the panelists. Several of you mentioned that um, mentioned about housing. So what kind of housing or real estate programs are helping out in this area? I mean, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll step into that a little bit. Um, of course, you know, there's a local housing within our county. Um, uh, CMHA is very um, uh, accessible to our seniors, but, um, you know, there's some good and bad parts about that. I, um, what Metro Health is doing, what Alan was sharing with us is, is wonderful um, because the issue with our senior housing is the, is is the quality of it you know for you know for the, for those that 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 can afford it there's wonderful quality senior housing out there um, but then there are some that that are that are literally living in a war zone and um and to be able to have that at least the basic safety um good quality housing for 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 our seniors across the board I think it's paramount. I think that's something we're still working on. And it sounds like what Metro Health is doing is what needs to happen. Uh, Ashley, I would, would add to that, you know, that the, the public housing component, uh, also there's a number of, of HUD uh, sponsored programs, uh, either vouchers for people to rent into existing properties or else uh, uh, HUD 202 properties that are funded specifically to offer an affordable housing option to older adults. Benjamin Rose operates uh, properties of that type. Um, uh, there's the the LIHTC or the housing tax credit programs to encourage private development in that space. Uh, and there's a lot of good information about all those programs available uh, uh, on the uh, on the, the website, and we can share some of those resources with people after the after the program. I think the other one that we think need to think about is 
for those folks that don't qualify for the supported housing, they're not low enough income, you know, if they're more than 200% of poverty, uh, but they're not wealthy enough to afford those privately funded assisted living or continuum of care community programs that, that uh, Willie referenced. Uh, and that's most people. And you know, that's probably 80% of the retirees in this country. They don't qualify for the supported stuff and they can't afford the other. And if, if there's a place that we really can focus more effort, it's those options for people that are affordable and safe and accessible, uh, you know, emphasizing affordable for that household that's living on forty, fifty thousand dollars a year or less in retirement. They're above they're above the uh, poverty thresholds. Uh, but they cannot afford uh, you know, a fifteen hundred dollar or two thousand dollar a month uh rent or uh maintenance fee uh in, in some of the other settings. And that's one we don't we haven't we have not solved that yet. So I would just add um, from the philanthropic standpoint, you know, for a lot of our members, like capital projects are outside of their scope. Um, they don't have the capacity to make capital investments, but a lot of our members do fund, you know, the services that go along with housing. There's, of course, an issue with sustainability there, and there's always more funding needed um, for housing with services, which, you know, we certainly have the evidence um, helps to keep people healthier and um, ultimately, you know, reduces healthcare costs. Um, but the other piece here that's, I think, particularly important to lift up for diverse communities is that um, there's, it, it's really important that we assist people in maintaining the value of their homes. Um, and so I'm talking about, you know, ensuring people can stay in their homes um, and eviction prevention and foreclosure prevention, but I'm also talking about home modifications and home improvements. Um, one of our newest members is Northern Trust, and they have this really interesting initiative where they are making improvements to the homes of older people and it benefits the older people by improving their quality of life and enabling them to accomplish their activities of daily living because they now have these uh, home modifications and improvements. But ultimately, you know, it enables people to transfer the wealth that's been accumulated in their home onto uh, the next generation. Um, and so, you know, there's really this connection between, you know, how are older people living now and how will the communities of tomorrow be living and what will those communities look like? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So I just wanted to remind everyone that with this version of Zoom, we do not have the capability of unmuting the attendees microphone. So if you do have a question and you've raised your hand, if you could please type it in the chat, or if you could please submit it in the Q&A. We did have a question come through. Um, they would like to know, this is for each of the panelists, what are you doing or considering in how we make sure that the unique needs of the dementia population are being met? What policy or programs can we establish that would ensure that we do not neglect portions of the population, such as individuals who are disproportionately impacted by Alzheimer's and other dementia? Would anyone like to start? Generally, I always have something to say, but I'm not smart enough to speak in this space and I don't want to I misrepresent know, anyone. Um, <laughs> if, if we think about, I'm just going to twist it a little bit. Um, from a mental health and behavioral health perspective, we saw a huge need in our community. So we decided to build a mental behavioral health and addiction hospital. Um, within the community. Now, this doesn't address um, the question in terms of Alzheimer's and dementia, but I do just want to share from a social determinants of health perspective, the link between mental behavioral health, addiction, and the criminal justice system. We also provide services in terms of correctional medicine at the county jail, the Cuyahoga County Jail, 
and about 75% of the folks who are behind bars have mental health issues, many of which in order to cope with those mental health issues, substance abuse and addiction comes into play. So, so we see that link. Um, as far as Alzheimer's and dementia, I, I apologize, but I'm not really comfortable addressing that one. Andy, very much. Um, so I can speak to this a little bit. Um, I actually started my career in aging, uh, running a social adult day program for people with dementia. Um, so it's a, an issue that's near and dear to my heart. And I do find that when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, with a focus on the inclusion, um, we often exclude people with dementia. Um, even when we program, we often focus our programming on the caregiver of the person with dementia and not so much on the actual person who is still a person who is living with dementia and still has much to offer. Um, you know, prior to coming to GIA, I spent years um, working in New York City on, on age-friendly New York City, age-friendly New York State. And a lot of the age-friendly communities initiatives sort of emerged and didn't adequately take the needs of people with dementia into account. And as a result, you have this sort of parallel movement for dementia-friendly communities. Where there's opportunity right now is with the growing momentum for state master plans on aging. And a lot of our members are really excited by the potential for a state master plan, um, with the first one being in California, where a group of funders came together, they pulled their resources, they mobilized both private and then public sector capital to come up with a state master plan that does include the needs of people with dementia. And so there's really um, a blueprint for all of us to say, how can we integrate these age and dementia friendly community initiatives and then ultimately codify it through these state master plans on aging, which also you know, have great potential to improve the lives of caregivers. The one thing that you know, we haven't said, and, and we brought up the issue of raise, and a lot of caregivers are caregivers of people with dementia. Um, you know, raise is 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 great and is progress, right? But Lauren mentioned the need for champions to you know hold uh, hold the feds and the states accountable. But there's also need for money, right? Because the Raise Act doesn't come with really any money attached to it. And so we will, we will need to be mobilizing as much private and public sector capital as possible, as well as human capital to advocate for the solutions required so that people can live well, whether they have dementia, whether they have other mental health needs, um, regardless of income or any other, you know, socio-demographic characteristic. Thank you. Can, can I hop in here quickly too? Of course. So just, you know, thinking about sort of like the entry point into services and accessibility, um, I was thinking about our work in the Public Health Center of Excellence in Dementia Caregiving, and there's also a Public Health Center of Excellence in Early Detection. But, you know, a lot of these, uh, even thinking of broad early detection campaigns or informational campaigns that are nationwide, those are not aimed at limited English provision communities. They're not necessarily aimed at a lot of communities where there's really deep stigma about talking about mental health, right? Like early signs of dementia, that's something many communities do not want to mention. Um, and providers not, don't know what to do with. Totally. And there's not even a word for some of the um, cognitive changes or things that you might be observing in different languages. And I think that's kind of where some of the, not only narrative change, but also tailoring educational campaigns toward different communities and thinking about, you know, we always say like how to meet people where they're at, but like what, what message testing can take place so that we can really have impactful messaging so that folks who are diagnosed with dementia, with Alzheimer's can get detected early and get the best care available and do the best practices. Um, I think that's just another tip of access to services. Yeah, those are all really great points. Thank you for addressing the, those issues. 
I want to take the time to thank you, Lauren, for your wonderful and thoughtful um, presentation. Thank you to our panelists, Lindsay, Willie, and Alan. Thank you for um, all of your insight into such important issues. I'd like to take the time to um, thank everyone for joining us today for our 16th annual CATS policy lecture and for your great questions that everyone submitted. We want to ask now that you help us improve future programs by just taking a quick moment to complete a short evaluation survey. The evaluation is voluntary and your answers will not identify you in any way. You can access the evaluation by clicking the link in the chat and it will also be emailed to you following today's lecture. Before you leave today, I would like to invite you to attend our upcoming events listed on the screen. More information and registration is available on our website, www.benrose.org. Again, thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again next year. Thank you. Okay, thank you. For having me. Thanks, all. Thanks so much.